In the 1960s and 1970s, the Vietnam War seemed to embrace all aspects of modern warfare, from guerrilla to armored warfare, from cutting edge air power to small four man boats armed with machine guns. There seemed to be no end to the threatening assignments for US forces committed to repelling communist Viet Cong insurgents from South Vietnam and their supporters in the North. Today on Bizarre History, we're going to look at the four most deadly jobs that you could be assigned in the Vietnam War. The Wild Weasel is an aircraft that would destroy missile radar emitters, allowing the F-4Es to use tactical nuclear weapons to destroy the rest of the missile site. This was also the first occasion that electronics were used to actively find targets during a mission instead of just predetermined beforehand. And of course, this was only matched by the bravery of the men required to fly down a radar beam and disable the site before the missile got them. In the short term, these daring aviators are tasked with flying specially outfitted fighter jets into enemy surface-to-air missile envelopes to entice SAM operators into attacking them with their radars. When a threat is identified, the radar waves are traced back to its source, allowing the wild weasels and other strike aircraft to destroy it. During the Vietnam War, the Air Force developed the Wild Weasel Radar Detection and Suppression concept to counter the growing surface-to-air SAM threat, particularly the Soviet-made SA-2 Goa. It's the same type of missile that toppled the CIA U-2 spy plane over Russia on May 1, 1960, piloted by Francis Gary Powers. After being shot down, Powers was imprisoned by the Soviets and eventually released to the United States. He's the subject of Tom Hanks's 2015 film, Bridge of Spies. The Weasel used two tactics to complete their mission during the Vietnam War. The first tactic, dubbed Hunter Killer, employed wild weasels to track down and kill enemy air defense systems. For lack of a better term, the tactic was developed through on-the-job training. It was their best play against the SA-2. The only thing the US military knew about the SA-2 was that it was camouflaged, had a scope of 15 to 20 miles, and used a target designed to track radar. The latter was critical for the weasels because it allowed them to zone in on the target with radar-seeking missiles, while the F-105s flew in with heavier ordnance and cluster weapons and ammunition to finish the job. We knew we could survive at low altitude using terrain masking, pop up to get their readings and attack the site, a former weasel pilot stated in a video. The second tactic was to safeguard the strike force during regular missions. The weasels would act as bait to encourage SAM launches that produced enough smoke to make them visible, much like a smoking gun. Meanwhile, the strikers focused on their objectives. The weasels would circuit the target area for 20 to 40 minutes, exposing themselves to enemy fighters, SAMs and air artillery shells. Both tactics were extremely dangerous and had a low survival rate. Helicopters existed during World War II, but the technology was still continuing to develop, so they weren't used as frequently. But even so, choppers were extremely common during the Vietnam War, and it was during this dispute that the United States conceived of a solely devoted helicopter ambulance corps. If they were impoverished and vulnerable to ambushes and landmines, roads were not required with dust-off crews and the injured and sick could be helicopter lifted out of the fray in less than 35 minutes with medical personnel on board tending to them while in motion. The fray, however, is a terrifying place, and the dust choppers and their crews were often sitting ducks. Dust Off, Army Aero Medical Evacuation in Vietnam is a book written by Peter Dorland and James Nanny. Theirs was one of the most dangerous types of aviation. Slightly more than a third of the aviators became casualties in their work, and the crew chiefs and medical corpsmen who accompanied them suffered similarly. Dorland and Nanny also stated that the rate of air ambulance lost to hostile fire was three times that of all forms of helicopter missions in the Vietnam War, and that aviators contemplating the job were warned that it was dangerous. Randall Drew, a veteran dust-off crew chief, spoke about his dust-off life experience. Some of the crew chiefs would stay in a hot LZ fight. I chose not to do that. It was already dangerous in an unarmed military transport. Drew also described one specific mission in the Mekong Delta. The air was thick with gunpowder. Even from 3,000 feet up, we could smell it. Phantom jets screamed in beneath us, dropping napalm while green tracers danced around our chopper. We were hit 34 times. We had to set her down about a mile away. I think that was the scariest moment I know. Ultimately, Drew stated, 
I still hear guys with their arms and legs blown off asking me to kill them. It was a threatening and terrifying job, but the dust off crew evacuated over 900,000 wounded and sick soldiers during the Vietnam War, and their importance cannot be blown out of proportion. The LRRP units were essentially Spec Ops units, and then another Vietnam War Spec Ops unit that faced a disproportionately large amount of danger was MACV SOG. The SOG had undertaken covert irregular warfare such as gathering intelligence, capturing enemy prisoners, conducting rescue operations, and carrying out other nefarious activities such as psychological warfare operations. SOG units, like LRRP units, had extremely high kill-death ratios, displaying a ratio of 158 to 1 in 1970. But their fatalities were even worse than the LRPS, with half of all SOGs dying in 1968 and every single one of them suffering at least one injury. Numerous SOG teams like the LRRPs went into enemy lines and never returned, and only a few SOG personnel were captured. When his helicopter was shot down, SOG Charles Francis Wicklow was taken by the North Vietnamese. They let Wicklow go only to pursue him through the jungle for several days, hoping to use him as bait to lure out and kill his mates. His abductors, however, overlooked Wicklow's health, believing he lacked the strength to flee, which he did. Wicklow made it home alive only because of his unusual situation and maybe just a little luck. Veteran Joe McGovern explained in an interview why he didn't back down from incredibly dangerous SOG missions. What kept us going? Pride in ourselves and our jobs. After all, we were special forces, and if I refused, I would never be able to look anyone in the face again. The same can be said for the other veterans interviewed in that discussion. What could be worse than being behind enemy lines? Being behind enemy lines underground in a maze of tunnels and networks with death potentially around every corner. Tunnel rats would crawl the maze-like tunnel networks underneath the enemy lines, infested with all manner of traps and hazards, including anti-personnel mines, spike traps, venomous snakes and scorpions, and poisonous gas. Tunnel rats would dive headfirst into the tunnels in small groups and scout them out, relaying information via radio and neutralizing surface mines and traps from below. Tunnel rats originated in the dark bowels of the earth with little more than a pistol, a knife, and a torch to avoid detection. If they were discovered, they faced countless and heavily armed perceived enemies. Gunfire in such confined spaces would both blind and deafen them, and hand-to-hand -hand combat was common. Tunnel rats have been known to plant C4 charges to later dismantle the tunnels and their belongings. Tunnel rat fatality rates averaged 33%. According to American tunnel rat Jack Flowers, he said something like, They'd enter the tunnel one at a time, separate it by several feet so a grenade wouldn't get us all. They'd scout the area for traps. It got to the point where we spent so much time down there, you could feel them. The same goes for VC. In the tunnel, you could smell another human being. You had a feeling he was waiting for you in the dark. You had to direct and control the fear. You need to be meticulous with your movements. Your senses have never been more acute. Your adrenaline is pumping like a river through the tunnels. According to Australian tunnel rat Jim Marrett, the term tunnel rat was a catchphrase for the work done by scion or combat engineers like himself. According to Marrett, as dangerous as that work was, the majority of our casualties were above ground. When we were engaged in the other part of our job, finding and disarming mines and explosive devices, tunnel rats go through these extremely small and extremely exhausting spaces. The fact that they had to travel kilometers upon kilometers in such small spaces makes me appreciate their work. Thanks for watching Bizarre History. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to watch the next video up on the screen. We'll see you next time.